Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir, good evening. Thank you very much for coming to my session. Today I will talk about a recent work we've been doing, mostly with my colleagues uh, in Germany, um, developing a platform uh, for running various kinds of supply chain simulations. So I'll share with you results of those simulations and how wonderful the platform is. This work is an outgrowth of the earlier work I have done uh, with other people. We have thought about the role of blockchain technology in supply chain management and operations management for a while. And we developed some ideas for where the technology is going to go into the future, where the applications are going to lie. And now this new platform that we developed helps us to test out some of those ideas what would happen when the technology is actually implemented. So here's some of the work that leads to this, and towards the end of the slide, these are the new results. This is the source of information uh, where the platform is located, if you want to look it up, the disaster game. Um, also, I want to do a short advertisement for the duration of this conference. One of the publishers kindly agreed to provide the version of our article for free to the participants. So if you would like to download it, please do so. I'll begin with general motivation based on the earlier work that I have done on the role of blockchain technology in supply chain management. We hear various claims. On one hand, people say this is revolutionary. On the other hand, there are articles that say that the technology hasn't produced any real results other than speculation and cryptocurrencies. So which one is it? If you look at the current applications of blockchain technology and supply chain management, you can group them into three categories. The first one is to establish the provenance and the chain of custody of goods in supply chain. <coughs> Companies tracking anything from fish to pork, from coffee to blueberries, to airplane parts as they are flowing through supply chains. The other group of applications is in providing proof of ethical and sustainable sourcing, fair trade practices. You can check how much a company pays the farmer for the coffee that you are consuming. You can directly tip the farmer using the company's platform, blockchain platform that they developed. This is the case for Folgers and their Farmer Connect platform. And the third group of current applications of blockchain technology in supply chain management is in general improvement of efficiency, keeping track of assets, keeping track of ownership, and generating data that can be used later on. Probably the biggest, most successful example in that category is the Trade Lens um, platform, which keeps track of the ocean freight data. So these are the current applications. But as researchers, we want to look forward five years from now, 10 years from now, where the value of the technology will be. When all of the hype falls away and the value remains, where the value will lie. For that, it helps to understand the basics of the technology. And most of you have seen various descriptions, and many of you are experts in this technology. So I'll just briefly say that from perspective of operations management people, what's important is that technology provides a proof, digital proof, uh, of the history of what happened. It promises to give us an incorruptible record of, let's say, transactions or any other information that's recorded there. 
Of course, you can use other technologies to accomplish the same things, but the way that blockchain technology is organized makes it more likely that this would be the case. Other important um, aspects of the technology from the perspective of operations management beyond having a proof that the history is the way it's described um, is the concept of tokens. Um, you probably have heard or participated in NFTs, non-fungible tokens. These are the digital claims to assets like art on the internet. For example, somebody paid $172,000 to buy the rights of ownership to this CryptoKitty on the slide there. I copied this CryptoKitty for free off the internet, put it on my slides, but I cannot copy the ownership rights. And this is the purpose of these tokens, which is to establish who owns the asset. And it will have and does have important applications in operations management, supply chain management. If you uh, paid attention to the technology in 2018 or so, there was a big craze of ICOs, initial coin offerings. These are also applications of tokens uh, which represent the claims on the assets of the company. Uh, the other important concept that's useful for operations management applications is that of smart contracts. Not only you can record information on blockchain technology, some of the platforms also allow you to run code, Ethereum being the prime example of that. By being able to run code on the blockchain platform, you can automate certain types of transactions. In the context of supply chain management, you can automate ordering decisions, you can automate trade transactions, you can automate financing of the companies. <laughs> Scootchain is a great example of the company that's using uh, smart contracts to expedite the flow of goods but at, by automating trade transactions. So ability to provide the data that we trust hasn't been altered ability to create tokens, and ability to automate certain steps in the supply chain transactions. These are the three things that we think um, represent the most value in the supply chain management applications. I often give talks about blockchain technology and I talk to companies and because I talk about this, um, and if I get to dispel the myth about the technology a lot. So we don't think that this technology is as revolutionary as some people claim. But we don't think it's a complete hype either. So one of the kind of big takeaways from my talk today is this slide. This is our framework of thinking whether your company needs this technology. There are five strengths of the technology and there are five weaknesses. It's a balanced list. For every strength, there is a weakness. Many of the strengths are not unique to blockchain. Other ways of digitizing supply chains will accomplish similar results. It's just that the blockchain technology might do it at a lower cost. Probably the biggest strength of the blockchain technology is the first one. That's the one that differentiates it the most from other technologies. Ability to give you information you trust, that's what the blockchain technology promises. Do you need blockchain for that? Not necessarily. If you know the provenance of your data, if you trust whoever shares the data with you, you don't need any technology to establish trust. But if the information comes from unknown sources, if it comes from faraway supply chain tiers, if you don't know how it originated, 
this is where you need the help of the technology to establish the trust in information. This is basis for every current application of blockchain technology. From tracking blueberries and fish and coffee through supply chains to proving ethical and sustainable sourcing, all of this relies on trust and information. This biggest strength is also the biggest weakness. Garbage in, garbage out. You can make mistakes when you record information on the blockchain in the first place. You can bribe a person who is supposed to make a record if the stakes are high enough. More interestingly, even if you correctly recorded the information in the first place, as the time goes by, the reality changes, life is dynamic. And so unless you have a system to update your digital representation of your supply chains, pretty soon you have a discrepancy between what the reality is and what your digital representation is. There are ways of overcoming this. For some of the applications, this is not a big problem. For example, provenance applications. Once you establish provenance once, once you know where the goods are coming from, that reality will not change. So you don't need to worry about updating it. This might be the reason why many of the initial applications of the technology were focused around establishing the provenance of goods. Easy to record and don't have to worry about updating it later. There are all kinds of tags and technology solutions that help to keep the connection between the digital and the physical world, but it's still a hard problem. Other strengths you should think about is increased visibility in supply chains. It's amazing to know that most companies have no idea who their second tier or third tier suppliers are, who their second tier or third tier customers are. Simply by overlapping your blockchain network over the supply chain network, you get some idea about the structure of your supply chain. Of course, the downside is the fact that you lose privacy. Consumers, data might be exposed. Your competitive information might become public. The next benefit of blockchain technology that might be helpful for your company, information aggregation. You can record all kinds of information, and companies do, from sensor readings to identities, to pictures, to videos. That's great as long as you have standards. Unfortunately, we are still at the stage where most of the blockchain technologies, they're not on the same standard. Process automation, ability to expedite the transactions is a big strength of the technology. Not only blockchain can do it for you, of course, but the advantage of the blockchain is the fact that when you automate the transactions, you trust the data based on which the automation works. And that's the critical part. The downside is the black box effect. The users are less likely to use the technology if they don't understand what's going on. And the final tool, the efficiency of the system is greater because blockchain technology is a distributed ledger copied on multiple computers on the blockchain network, and it's resilient to some kind of disruptions. Unfortunately, that comes at a cost of incredible inefficiency, both in terms of electricity consumption, carbon emissions, and electronic waste. So these are kind of pluses and minuses of the technology. So when I talk to the companies and they ask me, should I use blockchain technology? My competition is using blockchain technology. I should be doing the same thing, right? My answer is, here are the five strengths, five weaknesses. Can you articulate why a particular strengths apply to your case, why you can overcome the weakness, and why other technology cannot do a better job for you? Why do you need blockchain technology? If the answer is yes, then yes, this is the technology for you. 
So we had this idea how to think about blockchain technologies. Here's our framework. As I said, current applications are all focused on information, keeping track where the assets came from, making sure that uh, ethical, sustainable practices are being followed. What will happen in the future? Where are the business models? What kind of new applications the technology will find? And by extension, as researchers, what should we be thinking about? In addition to the information, which will remain a dominant, dominant part of technology application, the next tool, we think, will be tokenization, creating claims to assets of the firms, assets in supply chains, keeping track where these assets go, trading those assets, and automation, using smart contracts to coordinate supply chains across decentralized, self-motivated companies, relying on the trust in the data that is on the blockchain and allowing the automation to coordinate, orchestrate the way that supply chains operate. So we thought about this and we developed a platform to test out some of these ideas. So this is the main direction of the current research that we have. It's a web-based platform for running certain kind of games, supply chain games. Um, it's, this platform is available for free for academics to use for research or for teaching. I have used it in my classes with great success. And so far we have three research projects three types of experiments that we're running on this, and we're always developing new ones. And we welcome anybody who would like to collaborate with us. We'll give you the platform, we'll give you the access. As I said, it's all for free. It's a fantastic tool. We hope to promote more interesting research papers based on this. Here is an example of how we use this platform to test out an idea about using blockchain technology for creating markets in supply chain. So the typical situation that we're envisioning there is that we have groups of retailers that are buying from supplier. It takes time for the supplier to produce items it takes time for the transportation. So as the time goes by, new information arrives. So after the initial orders are placed, maybe retailers, they learn about their demand better. How do we help them to trade with each other to get a better allocation between supply and demand? Can we offer them a market? where if a retailer has access, they can sell the success to other retailers They have a shortage. Even more interestingly, can we give them a market where if some retailers have shortage, but they have a low valuation for the products, and other retailers have shortage, but they have a high valuation for the products, they can still trade with each other to achieve a better allocation. So why markets? We know from economics, markets are great for achieving efficient allocation. Also markets are great for signaling the value of the goods. Here's an example of markets at work. These are wheat futures contracts uh, maturing in September of 2022. You can guess at what point of time there was significant jump in the price of wheat the end of February of this year. Markets exist for many commodities in addition to wheat, but for most of the supply chain assets, they don't. The reason for that is that markets are expensive to set up and operate, and 
we just don't have enough of a volume in supply chains to justify the creation of the big organized markets. This is where the promise of the technology comes in. Blockchain technology promises to allow us to remove the intermediaries and keep the costs of tracking the assets, creating the claims to assets, verifying that the assets indeed exist, haven't been sold elsewhere, make it cheaper. So on the margin, blockchain technology should make it possible for more of the assets, the ones that are in the supply chains, to be traded with each other. We already have some form of trading in, uh, among retailers in some of the supply chains. This is called transshipments. So if one car dealership has shortage, other car dealerships has excess, they can sell cars to each other. However, transshipments require physical movements of goods, and that could be expensive. Also, transshipments come at certain restrictions on how these contracts are structured. So what we are thinking about is that let's make markets as flexible as possible. Anybody should be able to buy or sell. Any of the retailers should be able to buy or sell in these markets. Suppose we were to introduce a market like that. What do we want to know about the results? So probably the most important question would these markets provide more efficient allocation? Would they reduce shortages and excess? They better, otherwise the rest of the discussion is pointless. Next question, how would such markets operate? What would be the market clearing price? What would be the strategies that the retailers will use in trading in these markets? How would this affect the initial orders of the retailers? This is different from your traditional commodity markets where they are pure speculators who don't really have customers that just buy and sell commodities trying to speculate on the price movements. Here, our retailers, they have customers whose demand they're trying to satisfy and they first need to buy the goods from the supplier before they can trade those goods in the market. This makes them a bit different from the traditional commodity markets. How would the initial orders change? And what is the perspective of the supplier on a market like that? We set up a series of experiments using our platform where we test out different market configurations. We have the control experiment where we don't have markets among retailers. So in this case, retailers just buy from the supplier and then satisfy their customer demand. We have an experiment where we create small markets with the three retailers, groups of three. And we have large market experiment where every retailer is in the market. We also change the uh, procurement cost of the retailers, the wholesale price that they're paying, to consider different conditions. We look at the high and the low procurement cost. So initially, when the retailers are placing orders, they don't know what the demand is, but they do know what their customers are willing to pay for the products. After the retailers placed an order, we reveal the demand, and then retailers trade with each other. Accounting for the results of the trade, we then satisfy the demand for them. The prices are random, independent across retailers and independent across rounds of the game. The demands are random as well. Demands are uniform between zero and 200, and this will be important range to keep in mind, and I'll remind you why so. So this is how it looks like in the platform. So perspective of the user, they see their price that their customers are willing to pay, $93. 
Then they decide how much do they want to order from the supplier. Let's say they want to order 120 units. After every retailer in our game enters their order quantities, we tell them what their actual demand is. So this particular retailer sees the actual demand of 159. So they're 39 short. They can decide what to do about this. We allow them to place buy and sell orders in any combination up to five orders by specifying how much they want to buy or sell, how much they want to pay or receive for the units. I'll explain in a second how the market clearing works, um, but you can think of these numbers as the limit orders that the retailers are placing. Once everybody placed their buy and sell orders, we clear the market, we tell the retailers what the market clearing price is, I'll explain how we compute this, and then we describe what their cash flows are, how much of their buy or sell orders were executed, what their corresponding cash flows from the trade are, what their sales to the customers are, what their total profit is, what is their total profit up to this point in the game, and where they stand relative to the other players. Because we have small markets, we're worried about market manipulation. To avoid market manipulation, front running, for example, we organize our markets as a single time clearing price markets where players submit sealed bid orders. So they submit sealed buy and sell orders. Once everybody submitted it, we compute the market clearing price to do that, we form the supply curve and demand curve. We rank the sell orders from the lowest price to highest, buy orders from the highest price to lowest, and then we start matching the items on the supply and demand curves until we cannot match them anymore without violating the constraint that the sell price must be less than the buy price. The average of the prices of the last items that got cleared becomes the market clearing price. This means that every buyer receives the, or every buyer pays market clearing price, so they're paying less than they were willing to pay. Every supplier, or every seller, receives market clearing price, which is more than they were willing to receive, so everybody should be happy. So, that's the setup of the experiment, setup of the game. Now let's take a look at what does this produce. So the first hypothesis is that markets should improve allocation. We should have reduced excess and shortages as a result of having a market in the system. And here, no surprises. Indeed, markets work. What you see on the slide is a table where we report excess and shortage relative to the news vendor uh, in the markets of groups of three, in the markets of groups of all players, so small market, large market, with the cost condition that the wholesale price is $50, or so wholesale price is $10. Everywhere you see green, the greener the better, the white cells are statistically insignificant, but overall takeaway is very simple. Yes, markets work, producing allocation. The next question is how do markets work? And that's where it becomes interesting. What is the market clearing price going to be? The hypothesis that's reasonable to postulate, and we provide more details in the our analysis is that the market clearing price should not be a function of what the players paid to the supplier. Because once you have the units, it should not matter what you paid for them. What matters is what value they have for you now. It should depend on what your customers are paying to you. It depends on what is the net supply demand in the market where you operate. So that's the prediction we're making. 
shouldn't be a function of wholesale price, should depend on the conditions in the market, net supply, demand, and the prices that all of the retailers in the market are facing. This is the outcome that we are seeing. The two, slide, two graphs that you see correspond to two experiments. One is high wholesale price, 50, another one low wholesale price, 10. The orange line is the market clearing price over multiple rounds. The rounds are on the x-axis. The gray line is the market clearing price for the small markets, groups of three retailers. So what do we see? We see, first of all, that the market clearing price is anchored to the wholesale price of the supplier. That is very surprising. There is no logical reason, economic reason, why this should be the case. This is purely a behavioral effect. This is purely the consequence of the players not willing to admit that they will have a loss if they submit a lower price than the, they paid to the supplier. Next observation is that in the large markets, there are very little variation in the prices. The line is almost glued at the level of 50 or at the level of 10. In fact, there's such a little variation that there's no statistically significant effect of the market supply and demand and the price that the customers are paying on the market clearing price. What about the small markets? In small markets, we do have variation, much higher variation, so we might observe that there is a connection between the price and the conditions in the market. Indeed, we do. So here is a table that shows once we regress the market clearing price on the average sale price and net demand in the market, they show up with the positive coefficients as we would expect, and they are both significant. So what about initial orders? Initial orders, um, how would they change? So there are two predictions. One, we think that the players will act as transshippers. So if they have excess, they'll sell. If they have shortage, they'll buy. Other than that, they'll just behave normally. And if they act as transshippers, we have a second prediction. And the second prediction that the initial orders will be closer to the mean demand. And there's both theoretical and experimental studies uh, that show that that should be the case. What do we see? Here is the histogram of the initial orders. The red box corresponds to the optimal news vendor orders. There are many of them because our prices are variable. The blue bars are the frequency of the orders of different sizes. This is the news vendor experiment. Now I'm going to introduce the market. What we expect to see is that the order should move closer to the mean. And indeed they do. We see big spikes once we get the large and the small market around the mean demand of 100. So indeed we see moving closer to the mean. Okay, so far so good. Where's the big surprise? This is the big surprise. So some of the orders move closer to the mean, but other orders move to the edges. Here is an example. We have many more players placing orders of size zero or very few units. So what are they doing? How come they have a demand that they need to satisfy, which is between zero and 200, and they're not placing any orders? What are they thinking? What are they doing? This is what they're thinking. They're thinking, I don't know what the demand is going to be. But if I wait a little bit, I'll learn the demand, then I go to the market and buy on the spot exactly the amount that I want. They're relying on the market to provide the units for them. We call them spot buyers. Interestingly, there is a parallel strategy, complementary strategy, of the spot sellers. 
Same idea. They don't know what the demand is going to be. They want to reduce the risk of getting it wrong. They buy a lot of units, as many as 400. Remember, the maximum demand that you can observe here is 200. And then they learn the demand and excess units they sell off into the market. Interesting, right? And the rest of the players we call transshippers because why not? So this spot buyers, spot sellers, they seem to do something right, right? They seem to be managing the risk. How well does it work out for them? We can break out the profits of different categories of players based on their strategies. And unfortunately for spot buyers, spot sellers, except in one case, they don't do so well. They do much worse than the transshipper players. So again, green is better, red is worse. And we see in here transshippers most of the times making higher profits than the rest, and these are statistically significant differences. What about the types of companies? So here we have retailer, we have supplier, and we have the supply chain. So it turns out that the retailer and supplier have different perspectives. So retailer is always better off when we introduce the market. However, a supplier only likes the markets when the wholesale price is high and the revenue of the supplier goes down when the wholesale price is low once we introduce the market. Supply chain is always better off. It gets worse for the supplier. Bullwhip effect affects them. What you see on this slide are the graphs of the coefficients of variations in different experiments that the supplier sees. The top graph is high wholesale price of 50. The bottom graph is low wholesale price of 10. There's no difference in the top graph between the different lines. Different lines are news vendors, small market and large market experiment. But there is a noticeable and statistically significant difference between the coefficients of variations in the bottom graph. And the worst is when we have a large market. This is where the supply sees the highest variation in its orders. And the reason for that are the spot buyers and the spot sellers. These are the players that increase the variation of the orders from the perspective of the supplier. So what did we learn from this experiment? Markets work, but they work in an interesting way. Market clearing price anchors to the wholesale price, completely unexpected. Doesn't reflect the value of the goods in the large markets, reflects the value of the goods in the small markets. Uh, trading strategies, new trading strategies that we didn't think about, the spot buyers and the spot sellers. And the supplier would not like this type of development, the markets, in case of the high wholesale price situation. So because you will need to get the supply on board when creating such a markets, this is not when the markets are likely to happen. So OK, great. What else can our platform do? We also ran an experiment where we share the competitive information on the history of orders of retailers. So typically when you talk to managers, they constantly tell you, I want better information. I want more information. So we decided to test out what are they going to do with that information. We gave them all of the information about the supply that they're going to see for all of the experiments. We told them all of the information about the demand they're going to see and their competition is going to see. So the third piece of the puzzle they would need to run the system is to know what their competition is going to do. And for that, we share with them history of orders of their competition. And we have several scenarios that we run where we share no information, we share average 
of your competition's orders from the last round. We share exactly your competition orders in the last round, and we show the full history. And this is what we see when it comes to orders. So we set the situation where there's a shortage of units. So you're going to have order inflation happening as in the bullwhip effect situation. The green line at the bottom is what the actual demand that the players are observing, 50 units. For every experiment, there's an order inflation. The blue line going all the way to 1,200, this is where we give them no information. They inflate the orders, but gradually. They certainly order more than they need. So that we already knew will happen. This is what we didn't know. Once we give them information, how is that going to affect their ordering inflation? So when we gave them the average of the other two retailers, last round order, there was a higher order inflation. When they gave them individual orders, it had the highest rate of order inflation. It went the fastest up. And the yellow line is when we give them the full history, which is kind of strange, right? Given the player's full history also implies that we're giving them information for the last round. So how come they react differently to this? And again, this is behavioral explanations. We think they are anchoring to the most relevant salient information once we just give them the last round one, whereas if we give them the full history, they do some averaging. Once we did that, we also ran an experiment where we said, well, we limited supply, like we have limited supply during the pandemic of many products. Suppose the supply goes back to being plentiful. What's going to happen? So this is the last graph. So we limited supply up to round 15, capacity of 90, and they have a demand of 150 across three of them. So we see order inflations going all the way to 10,000. Then in round 15, we relax and we say, okay, now you have exactly what you need for demand, 150 or you have 25 more than you need, or you have 100% more than you need. So we look at what happens, and it turns out that even if you have plenty of capacity, once you reach this equilibrium that you are over-ordering in your supply chain system, you stay in this equilibrium. Even if we give you 25 more percent more capacity, you still order a lot. It takes a long time before you go back to somewhat reasonable levels. Even if we double the capacity, you're still going to see very slow return to normal. So bad news following the pandemic. I'll stop here. Hopefully this was enough for advertisement for the platform for you guys to get interested and try it out. Thank you very much, Professor David. Uh, important it's time for session now. If you have got one small question, perhaps. You have questions? So move to the session. Thank you very, very, very much, Professor David. Thank you.